So welcome. I don't, I don't know who you are. Uh, my name is Victoria. I came a long time ago, but then I went away, and then I came back. Right. You live here in New Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just this week, we just did a team with the Lenders of the Victoria. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's start. So we've been learning uh, from Yov, from the book of Job, oh. how to uh, do therapy. <laughs> so, if you remember the last time, uh, which was four weeks ago, even I think we haven't had class for three weeks. So, we basically started with uh, Yov's rant, you can say, or he raves at Hashem. He finally opens up his, his mouth at the end of chapter 2. says, That Eov finally, he broke down after he's been afflicted by all these things and his companions come to offer him some tanchumim, some consolant. Uh, mm -hmm. And he breaks down suddenly, and he starts cursing his day. What does it mean that he curses his day? He curses the day that he was born on. And we said that Iov is living in a time when everything is governed by astrology. The way that people understand, excuse me, everything that's going on in their lives is that it is somehow governed by the stars, it's governed by their influence on, on their lives. And most important out of everything is the day that he was born on. And from that we get this, uh, this statement, uh, everybody knows this, uh, the, the Rebbe actually used this a lot, it's called an auspicious time. Auspicious really comes from the words meaning stars. <laughs> meaning it's a... Uh, it's meant to be, right, it's a, it's a special time. Sorry? And then he curses his mother's womb, and he curses everything. Yeah, but he starts out by, He begins cursing his, his day. So, interestingly, this is the same theme of this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha, Balak, is about you want to call him a magician, a prophet, he has a lot of different uh, categories that he fits into. And he's hired by Balak, by the king of Moab at that time, to come and curse the Jewish people. And it's like he asks Hashem a few times, should I go, should I go, every time Hashem says no. And then suddenly Hashem says yes. What's going on? Why did Hashem change his mind? What is what goes through Bilaam's mind when he sees Hashem changing his mind. He says there's an opening. There might be a moment, this is the way the sages interpret this, there might be a moment when it's possible for me to curse them. I have to find that moment. How do I know there's such a moment? Because it says, Kel zo'em b'cholyom. Even God is angry at some moment every day. And how long is, is, is the moment of his, uh, how long is he angry for? It says for a moment. Rega. Rega is very short. It's not like our rega. Our rega, people use it like for a minute. But it's really a very, very short span of time, which might be a few milliseconds. So that, that's the amount of... And you have to time it. <laughs> and if you curse at exactly the right moment, the curse will work. Okay? So all this seems very foreign to the modern mindset. And what does this have to do with therapy? But the truth is that overcoming the need to time things is one of the most important things in, in, in uh, the way somebody called it yesterday, rewiring the mind and figuring out a different way to live. Um, 
like anything else, to say that there is timing in the world, that there is a certain moment that's suspicious, that's great, and it, this is the right time to do something. First of all, it, it's an isser today. It's called a me'onen, somebody who says the time for this is now, the time for that is then. Is one of the different ways of the emorim, uh, uh, the Amorites, who were a nation that lived uh, in uh, the land of Israel before we, uh, we came here. And to say that I do things by this moment is a very big problem. Now, right? We but, and I also mentioned before that the Rebbe used to say it should be an auspicious time. So what's going on here? There are times when the can come in. Right, and then you have these things of Kishuvei kids. There's a time that's ready for Mashiach to come, and then he doesn't come. So right. Right. Because everybody has a certain uh, day that it was wrong. Well, instead of Kishish time, it's for that person, right. for all your speeches, for everybody. For right. 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 He means more general. It doesn't mean for ah, one particular person. person. For sure, but still, it's because the same. It's person according to the day that they were born. No, no, no. So that that he doesn't say. It. That he would never say, but he says it in terms of that it's an auspicious time. In terms of that there's an etra, like what you said, etra tzon, there's a time of, of will from above, of good will from above, that can allow things to happen. But anyway, everything here is very difficult because what we, what are we saying? We're saying that there is something else controlling our lives, meaning it's putting you exactly in the position of being a victim again, yeah, except now you're being victimized by time. There's timing. So one of the first things that I think happens to people, what, right, when they come into therapy, they begin, they begin questioning not so much their actions as much as their timing. Like if I would have just done this differently, in a different way, in a different time, if I would have done it in a different time, it would have worked out in a completely different way. And then you start getting this picture that maybe... You know, what I should be thinking of and what I should be living with is, is some rhythm that I'm missing, some pulse, pulse of reality that I'm just off of. But if I would get it right, then it'll work. For instance, I think that that's what governs people a lot of times when they fill out the lottery. They're, they play the same numbers all the time, thinking there will be the moment when this is the right thing, meaning they understand, they're what? They're correct, except it's right. Right. <laughs> they, they understand that if it's, if it's really random, so it's going to take, you know, a million years. But they have this feeling that somehow things might align for them because they're the ones choosing these numbers. So there's some connection between how time is passing and what I'm going to get as a result of it. But let, let's say more than that. Um, there used to be, a, when I was growing up, this thing called biorhythm. I don't know if anybody remember the word. Actually, they came out with calculators. It was so popular, so popular that when calculators started coming out, there were calculators that, that calculated your biorhythm. What's your biorhythm? It was some kind of uh, cycle of 28 days that every person goes through, and there's up and up, it's like a sine wave. And so there's times of up and times of down, and you just have to figure out exactly when your 28 days begin and when it ends. It's terrible when you do that, because it gets down there. And, right, and exactly, you, you become... It's too good news, it's too bad news. Right, you become a victim. You become a victim. It's a, it's a, it's a modern, it was a modern form of astrology, basically. Same, same idea. Either. What? It's not wrong, either. Okay, hold on, so we'll see if it's, <laughs> if it's not wrong. But definitely what it puts you in is in a position that your life is governed by something else. And, and we can say that this is the, this is the issue that um, Avram Avinu had. Right? Because his understanding before Hashem took him out and took him above the stars was that everything really is governed by the passage of time. It's really governed by the stars. It's really governed by uh, all kinds of forces that are around you, and you're incapable of really affecting. So all this would be, and, and, and there's always this question about astrology in, 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 in Yiddishkeit, 
Do we accept it? Do we not accept it? It, it lingers on. It's never really been completely solved. So we're going to have to solve a little bit of it today. Not because we can't solve everything, but at least at least treat the topic and try to understand what do we really look at when we're talking about astrology. But I want to understand this whole thing of timing that Eov comes and, and he says the first thing is um, his first complaint, the first um, uh, focus of his anger, of his frustration, is not himself, right? is not what he did because he's convinced that he's done everything properly. So what is there left to, to argue against? The that timing. I did, I, the timing was wrong. That if I would have born, been born on a different day, if I would have done things in a different time, then everything would have worked out. And it can't be that I haven't done things properly. It's a, it's, a, it's a very strong point of contention that we have, that we want to hold on to our actions, to validate them, to continue to validate them, but at the same time, to figure out why is it that this didn't work. And without... without um, uh, in the end, uh, arguing against ourselves, but rather arguing against something on the outside. So really, in, a, in the end, you're left in a state of being a victim. This time you're a victim of time. Now there's a very interesting thing. Why did I, I call this class, You Can't Time Anything? Because I heard this from my brother-in-law. He's a very smart guy. So he told me after years of being in the world, he came to the conclusion, he's talking about more about... Um, fiscal matters, like uh, where you invest and what you invest. He says in the end he's come to the conclusion you can't time anything. <laughs> that don't do things based on trying to beat the market or something like that, because you can't time it. You don't know how to time it. In the end, it'll always backfire on you. So do things because you need them, not because you figured out a way to, 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 to win. So it's a very interesting concept, not to try to time things. It's like that the people who are beyond uh, being a victim, have freed themselves, let's say, by saying, I'm not going to be a, a victim of time. So a way of saying that is, you can't time anything. Then you begin to start saying, so what, so what do I do in the world? What I do doesn't depend on the timing. I mean, there has to be something else. But that's also a very problematic uh, uh, point of view. Why? Because it says that all times are the same in the end. And that's not true, because we already mentioned that there's a Jewish calendar, there's a Rosh Hashanah, the, the, the year has a head. Okay? It's like saying, it doesn't matter which, I have to give you a, a, a pound of my flesh, like in Shakespeare, it doesn't matter which pound you'll take. Of course it matters. <laughs> if you take my heart, I die. If you take my brain, I die. If you take my hand, no, you can continue to live. So it's not true that everything is equal. You can say, I, I haven't figured it out. But comes the Torah and says, yes, there is, there is timing in the world. There is a time for this and a time for that. Yeah, yeah but the important thing is the attitude of the person towards time. If you're anticipating this is a good day and this is a bad day, what mm -hmm. you have to yeah. do is very dis to use very destructive. Now, we know that there's good days and bad days. Anyway, the calendar in general, so your attitude is even if it's a bad day, besides the calendar for you, you have to try to overcome it, or you have to let it be, and then the next day you're going to be better, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's only, you know, it's only your attitude that counts. So, 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 there are good and bad days that we know. So <laughs> comes somebody and says, so since that, that's the way it is, there's good and bad days, and I have no control over it, so from my point of view, everything is really equal. I can't, that's exactly the point, I can't time anything. Meaning, I just have to somehow get through all of it. There's going to be ups and downs, and I just have to get through it. But the Torah doesn't seem to be saying that. It's saying that there's Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means that this is different, this day is different. Good or bad is not the question. It's essentially different. Whether you have a good day on that day, or you don't have a good day, or you have a poor day on that day, on Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is a different day from the day that comes two days afterwards. It, in its essence, is something else. And so there's, there's an understanding, certainly in Yiddishkeit, I'll say it even more, that we mentioned before, you asked the question whether the Rebbe was, was t when he said an auspicious time, wh whether, he was, wh whether he was referring to the person's uh, personal history. 
And one of the interesting things that the Rebbe did that nobody else was willing to do before him was he started celebrating a birthday as a religious day. The Rebbe did that before. They, again, might have, but it wasn't for the Hasidim. I don't think Hasidim did it. But he, he, he encouraged other people yeah. to use their birthday as a special day. Mazal. It's Mazalo Gover even. <laughs> and what happens if you have a terrible birthday? <laughs> so what do you say? That I have terrible Mazal. So that's like, Job was not a Hasid. On the contrary, he says, what a terrible birthday I had. He took, the, he took the advice to heart, and he said, yes, the, even personally... Don't, don't they argue about what the stars are all together? The Rambam says the stars... Yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, this is not, this is not a simple sugya, this whole mm-hmm. thing. So what we're going to try to do is offer at least the answer that was given in last week's Parsha. And the answer that was given in last week's Parsha is very interesting. Towards the end, there's a... a Pasuk that's very strange. The whole the whole end has a shira in it, the shira of the bear, of the well, of Miriam's well, and then and then there's this song, part of the song that says, "Al ken Muslim, Therefore, those who make parables say, "Bo cheshbon." Let us calculate. Cheshbon yeah, is to calculate. Tibone v'tikonen ir sichon. The city of Sichon was the king, one of the kings that Moshe Rabbeinu already defeated. It shall be built. Al ken Moshlim, those who make parables, that's the pshat. That there are, I guess, poets or anybody else who writes in parables, and they will calculate. Let us calculate, and by calculation we will build the city of Sichon. What are the, what's hiding behind us in the Pshat? The Pshat seems to be that there are these poets or astrologers or whatever they are, and they see the world as a parable, and if you calculate properly what the right time to do something is, then you can build a city that will last for a long time. is something we say about Yerushalayim today. But they used to say it about Sichon. Okay, and they had this whole thing, and, and it's related, by the way, to Miriam's well. It's also, it's, it's a, this is a, a, a sugya inside the sugya. I don't want to get into, the, into Miriam's well now, just to mention that this is mentioned as a, as a continuation of the well, because wells also have um, a pulse. They have a time that they, one of the main things, if we mentioned this, we'll just mention in passing, that how did Eliezer know that Rivka was really the woman that should, should be, he should take for Isaac, for Yitzchak? He knew this because he saw that when she went down to the waters, the waters came up to her. Oh, what's special about that? <laughs> because waters don't come up for everybody, right? <laughs> uh, but they do. But they do. There are times, people know that there are certain times of the day that you go to a well, the water is higher. And there are times that you go to the well, the water is lower. Yeah, the difference here the was... Access, yeah. There's a place in... Yeah, yeah, you're right. Is it real? Avadi Kant, of course. You go there, and it's like a clock. Yeah. You can yeah. set your watch to it. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. I just think there's a so, machine. I never believe it. No, there's no machine there. There's no machine there. <laughs> it's an actual place with actual... There are many times I really don't believe. Bizarre. Yeah. So, it's not so bizarre. Because... Right, here we're talking about In any case, <laughs> in any case, so, but she was different. She went down, apparently, in a time when nobody was expecting the water to go up. And suddenly it went up anyway. So th- here you have the beginning of an understanding that 
it could be that you could control time instead of time controlling you. That there's a, there's a switch in the mind that can happen. That when it happens, it's a sign that this person is working on different time. Okay, so... Or is it like a matchup, really? No, so if it's a matchup, that's called auspicious. Not, not a comma, but like if you've reached a certain level, so it will rise up. Okay, to okay. fair enough. Okay. So let's, let's begin to unravel this. Yeah. When you're talking about mashalim and calculate, that's like two opposites. To, to, to write a parable, right? So we'll, we'll say in a moment what, how, the, how the sages or how in Chassidus this is interpreted. The word mashalim can also be understood in a different way. But the pshat still holds. You'll see that the pshat still holds. Okay. So let's get into, let's begin to get into the thick of this thing. And uh, should see how much time we have, so I don't know. Um, Avram Avinu wrote a book or at least he's the author of the content of the book and then later it was codified in the time of Rabbi Akiva it's called Sefer Yitzirah, the Book of Formation and the Book of Formation is based on it's very interesting, it's one of the few books in the, in the Jewish library that makes no mention whatsoever of any single mitzvah there's not a single mitzvah mentioned there so right away you see that this is a strange book and it fits for the time of the patriarchs because they didn't have mitzvot yet. It's very rare to find a Jewish book that doesn't mention a single mitzvah. That something it has to mention. If it's not a book about mitzvot, it'll mention something in passing. Um, and this one doesn't have anything. What is it about? So he divides the world into three dimensions. Olam Shana Nefesh. World and time or year and Nefesh or Psyche. Okay, world, time, and Psyche. How is this all understood? How do you put this in context for a modern Jew? What, do, what are we talking about here? And there's no mitzvahs mentioned there. So the way that the Alter Rebbe explains this this is in uh, one of the last Maimarim from last week's Likutei Torah. He says that the world represents the vessel. Particularly, it could be any kind of vessel, but particularly it's, it's the, human, the human vessel, for a human being, for one who speaks. The vessel, though, we know is not alive without some kind of life force in it. So the life force, he says, that's the nefesh, right? That's exactly what you would expect. And this is all very well and good. It's very easy to understand, right? There's a nefesh, and it gives life, it's a life force for the vessel. Of course, when the nefesh goes into the, into the vessel, why is the vessel, he says, called an olam? Why do you call it an olam? Because it hides the, the life force. You don't see it. Okay, famous joke. Does the teacher have a brain? Well, he can't see it, so he doesn't have a, right, a mind, at least. You can't see the soul, you can't see the mind, so who said it exists? We don't know that it exists. Because that's what the vessel does. It, it conceals. So that's the usual picture. There is light and a vessel. There is life force and the body, right? There's the soul and the body. What's time doing there in the middle? What is the year doing there in the middle? So the Alter Rebbe says something that is truly revolutionary. I don't think anybody said it quite this way before him. That the year, the dimension of year in the middle, teaches us that the life force cannot enclose itself in the vessel without a pulse. That's how he understands the word Shana. Shana time, he says, is what it says about the angels that Ezekiel saw in the vision of the chariot. That the life, you can read it as animals, meaning the name of angels, or you can read it as chayut, as the life force. The chayut 
runs and returns. And what do you understand by run and return? You, so the simplest meaning is that it's a pulse. Right? Without a pulse, the light force cannot enclose within the, the vessel. So there's no connection between the nefesh and olam. As much as, as they're meant for one another, you also need a, life, uh, a, a pulse in the middle, a mm -hmm. run and return in the middle, a timing. And, and this was before I speak? <laughs> no, the explanation, ah, it's on me? Okay, this is from the Alter Rebbe. That's why I said, okay, that's why I said that when I read it this week again, it suddenly hit me. Now the reason it really hit me it's very interesting. You won't enjoy this, but I'll still say it. Because some people will. Some people will. I mean, it might hit you, it might not. For me, it like hits where, exactly where I need it to. Um, because it's what I used to do in the world. Um, I, I saw a question this week on Quora that asked, why is it that computers no longer have higher and higher clock rates? I'll explain what I mean. So when you buy a, a computer, one of the things that you used to ask was how fast the CPU was running. So pretty much they're stuck at two and a half gigahertz, which means that the internal clock of the machine runs at two and a half billion pulses per second. It's, you have to have an oscillator, something giving the kitsif, the rhythm, so that everything works together. And if you don't have that rhythm, everything goes out of sync. So somebody asked the question, why is it that they don't keep going up? It used to be when, when I started out with computers, which was like in 1979. So we were working at 8, eight kilohertz, meaning 8,000 pulses per second. And in a matter of about 30 years, it went up from 8,000 to 2.5 billion. Wow. So the, and that's one of the reasons why computing power com continued to multiply. There's something called Moore's Law. There's a, somebody who made a projection that every 18 months, computing power would, would double. One of the ways to achieve that was to clock it faster, to make the clock work faster. So, the whole thing. so he asked, why does it keep going up? For the last 10 years, it's been stuck at two and a half. No, so amazing thing. That everybody, a lot of people gave answers, and finally a good engineer gave an answer. And he said... The simple reason is that it, it, the, the, everything becomes too hot. That yeah. when you raise the speed of the clock too high, the silicon breaks down, it starts breaking down. So the only way you can build a CPU that goes over two and a half or three gigahertz is you have to start putting it into active cooling. Mm -hmm. So it can be a, 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 there are systems like this. There's stuff like that today, you can buy that. And then you can overclock, they call it, and you go, go to even to 5 gigahertz, maybe. I'm not sure exactly how much you can overclock, but you can go higher. And then finally, right, and finally, the really big computers, like supercomputers, super they use liquid nitrogen to cool it, because it's so hot. And they really run at very high gigahertz levels. So the internal, so, but the whole thing, the whole reason I'm bringing it up, it, it up is because it just, it just reminded me how important it is, you've got the electricity, which is like the nefesh, you've got the silicon, the CPU, which is like the vessel, but the whole thing doesn't work unless you have an internal clock that's... Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. What is he saying also? He's saying that it all depends on what your internal clock is working on. Everybody needs an internal clock. The only problem is that most people feel victimized or that they have a necessity to work by the external clock of the world. That's what it means to be linked to astrology. That's what it means to be forced to use some clock. You have to have some clock. You can't not work on a clock. Because the life force will not go into the vessel. So he says, God built the world in such a way that there is a world clock. There is such a thing. It exists on many levels. There's the astrological level that gives the rhythm based on the whole movement of all the stars and all the uh, planets. There are smaller rhythms in reality. So for instance, um, what we mentioned about water is going up and down, they have their clock, the old faithful in uh, Yosemite, and biorhythms even. That there are things in the body that provide a rhythm for how everything works. By the way, there's a whole 
I once met a long time ago, he's already passed away a long time ago, but I met a very, very good doctor, somebody who was both a, a regular MD, but had done a lot, a lot of study of older techniques. He wasn't a quack. He only wanted, he, he studied things that had been lost. And he said one of the things that doctors have lost, and this I heard from another older doctor who I still know is very, is Rav Steinemann's doctor, and, you know, is very special doctor. They told me both that doctors don't know how to listen to the pulse anymore. They can only measure it, but they don't know how to listen to it. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting yeah, thing. You mentioned that one to my kids. Yeah. I mentioned it because there's a, an old book of Kabbalah that's called, uh, it's about the world of Malbush. Not, not, not what we're interested in right now, but just it says something very interesting there. It says that Ezra the Sofer, who wrote a lot of what it says in the Chumash over again in, in, in Divrei Amin, in Chronicles, he could only hear the external pulse, and Moshe Rabbeinu knew how to listen to the internal pulse. What does that mean? So he Mamish explains it there. He says, the external pulse is when you take a pulse here, mm -hmm. and the internal pulse is when you take it here, and they're different. And it could be that from here you'll decide that the person is sick or even dead, and here, you'll hear something else, that he might still be alive. What did he say this about? He says it's about the eighth king of Edom. That in the Torah it says that he ruled, and it doesn't say anything about his dying. But in Divrei Ayamim, when he repeats it, he says he ruled and he died. He mentions that he, he died. So th this ancient book says that Ezra could only feel the pulse on the, on the hand. So he could only feel that there was no pulse and he was dead already. This this again, this uh, ancient this king of Edom, but Moshe Rabbeinu he feels the pulse here because he feels it here he he senses something else and he's still alive. Does he, he can't write that he's dead yet. In any case, what is saying? Again, what I'm saying is that um, that rhythm is essential to bodily health. It is essential. The problem is that we've lost again, at least in medicine. It's mostly been lost how to listen to the pulse the right way, not just to hear the rhythm in terms of measuring how many times per second it is, because it's never exactly the same thing, right? You know, if you ever take in your pulse, you see that you know there's one beat that's like that and one beat like that, and then the average is you say you know he has 70 uh, beats per minute, but really it changes and fluctuates all the time. And hearing that rhythm, hearing the changes in it, is uh, uh, is, is, is a very strong diagnostic tool that's been lost over time because just doctors don't use it anymore for, for whatever reason. Actually, it could be very easily brought back because today all you have to, I mean, you have to computerize it. So you can see exactly, you could chart it out exactly. You wouldn't have to say he's got 70 beats per minute. You could say, well, over time, we see that 50% of the time it's uh, 70. And, it's and it can lead to diagnosis if you correlate it with different types of diseases. So there has to be a pulse of reality. And you have to connect yourself to some pulse. So somebody who believes in astrology, they're connecting themselves to the pulse of, of the stars. The chiddush that Avram had was that Hashem took him out of the star system. It was fine, but then you have to you have to get a pulse from somewhere else. You can't live without a pulse. That's what it's saying. You have you have to have some ratzel v'shov. You have to have some shana element in you to be able to live, to be to allow the life force to enter into the vessel. Yes. I wanted to tell a story before. I was observant, I looked at all different things, and I loved the story. I was, I don't know how many, I lived in New York, next to, around the circle, where there was a bookstore, and I had all these books on astrology, and somebody read my, uh, oh. my oh. astrological oh. Uh, chart, and yeah, I was amazed how certain things you could see that I'm in my life, that I could read the astrological chart very well. Then I came here to Israel, it's really difficult to get astrological books, so once I was going to go to Miami, and I said, great, I'm going to get more astrological books. So I go to Miami, and the day that 
I decided to go to the store by Sotheby. It was a holiday and it was closed. And the day after, I had to come back to Israel while I was going to leave. I, had, I was so upset, and when I get to Europe, I'm going to I was really upset. <laughs> and I put all this energy that I was going to get all these books. So my friend tells me, why don't we go to the Jewish bookstore? Instead. <laughs> what do I find okay, there? <laughs> the Jewish the information that I was doing. So I went to the Jewish bookstore to buy me some things. And I get into this uh, Sefer Tehillim. And I think it was Tehillim 67, I don't remember. But it, it was this book that explains, first of all, there is a, a little thing about the Tehillim. And then it's in English and in Hebrew. It explains a little bit what the Tehillim was all about. So that page that I often say, it's not important. Uh, something to the, I don't remember the words, but the idea is that it's not important because people believe in astrology. It's not important the astrology. The important is whether you're willing to do the astrology. Mm -hmm. That is the car. Not how this goes here and what happens, but whether you're willing. And that they need describe the idea is that we have to be in zinc with the right, right, right. So that cured me. Right. Then I, you know, I said, okay, I don't need to. Uh, so it was a message for me. Very, it's a beautiful story because it, for me, it, 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 re it reflects how you got rid of one timing scheme, one clock, and you exchanged it for another. Yeah. Okay, and this clock that Avram suddenly received, this clock is based on something else. It's not based on time. Okay, this is the important thing. That a clock, when I put a, a clock into a computer, it's not aligned with anything in the world. It doesn't matter. It's aligned with itself. That's mm -hmm. it. It's its own internal clock. Mm -hmm. And it's running at whatever speed it wants I can, I can put it at. What a computer is supposed to teach me here is that I have to build an inner clock. I have to build an inner shana, a dimension of time inside myself. And that's what it would really mean that you can't time anything because I, I don't want to time things by what the world says. I want to time it by what Hashem says. Again, Hashem also said that there is a natural clock in the world. That's fine also. But that natural clock is not His will, it's something else. Okay, and without getting into the discussion exactly what it is. But it's not the revelation of His will. It's only a revelation of something external. The will is something much more internal. How do you come to that? So the Indian here is, the point here is that the mitzvot, what Hashem gave Avram after He gave him, uh, He took him outside of the astrology, He took away his old clock. He started giving him a new clock. Really, that's a, a, another way of understanding why Avram was so had so much anticipation for Hashem to finally give him a mitzvah. Because as far as Avram was concerned, that was the beginning of his time. Right? That was he began to have a new way of measuring time based on what Hashem tells me to do. It's a very interesting thing because, and this is very important. Where, during the daily cycle, the Jews have the most involvement with time, as a Jew? Without prayer. Prayer. There, what's the understanding there? That the time makes the prayer, or something else makes the prayer? So, in the Gemara, there is two reasons for why we pray three times a day. One is that it was this way from the time of the patriarchs. Avram made Shacharis, and Yitzchak made Mincha, and Yaakov made Meirev. How did they know when to daven? They were setting up a new clock. They weren't basing it on the old astrological clock. They weren't basing it on natural time. On the contrary, they were trying to build an internal clock, which is going to work in a different way. What is it going to work with? With your run and return to God. So there's a delicate balance here. <laughs> On the one hand, when you're building an internal clock, somebody can say, so it's, what can I do? It's, it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, but I'm not ready to daven yet. 
So somebody who's running by the clock on the wall, right, so he says, well, you missed uh, the avenue time already, there's no point. And what do you mean you're not ready yet? The time comes, you have to daven. You don't ask yourself whether internally it works for you or it doesn't work for you. Because the whole point is to fit yourself to time. But, the, but there's a problem with that approach also. Why? Because what are you saying? Okay, I, I, I changed my astrological clock for, uh, you know, Casio. <laughs> Somebody else is dictating how time, how this dimension of, of, of time is working. So once again, you might fall into that feeling that it's all about timing, right? Davening is all about timing. If you daven chakra is two minutes too late, you missed out. You didn't do it. It's all about timing. It doesn't matter how well you daven. It all, right? Like the person was coming in for therapy. It's like a feeling it doesn't matter what you did. The question is when you did it. If you would have done it at the right time, even something that later seemed like it was wrong would have been perfectly good. And so you become a victim of time again. It's just a different type of time. Instead of talking about uh, Saturn moving around where it's moving, or saying it's in this house or that house or whatever, <laughs> wherever it is, so now I'm talking about the Casio on the wall. And now that's dictating how my time works. So it's very delicate, this whole thing. If you really want to build a Vatsovashov, a Shana dimension in you, that is free of being a victim, and rather dictates how, or, or allows you to take responsibility for what you're doing. So you have to divorce it from what's around you. You have to see your, your, yourself as autonomous and as figuring out how to build an internal clock that will make things right. Okay? So what we learn from... Uh, we'll say a few, uh, something more in a, mi- in a minute about this. But what we learn from Eov is that when you're a victim of time, you can be a victim of time just as much as anything else, these are your circumstances, then the feeling is that you're not in control, and not in control means mostly, like we t- we've said so many times, that I can't really change anything, that nothing can really change, because I'm just a victim. And so one of the things is to be to be aware, to, to be conscious when you're talking to somebody, do they feel that their timing is off? Are they telling you that really I'm okay, it's just that I should have done it at a different time? And they can't think about the fact that maybe what I'm doing is wrong. It has nothing to do with my time. Or, if my timing is wrong, so what do I want to do in order to build a different way of relating to time? Meaning, have I come to the conclusion that you can't time anything? There's no, unlike you know, hours and minutes, there's no big clock in the sky that tells you, now is the time to buy something, now is the time to sell something, it tells you, now is the time to call your mother, now is not the time to call your mother. If you call, if you call your wife now, she'll be very nice to you. If you call her in 10 minutes, she won't be nice to you. Well, where did he get that from? Internally, he built it internally. Right. No, said it, hold on, hold on. To say that, okay, at some level, to be able to to tell somebody else, um, it could be that it's a high level. But in terms of each one of us personally, there has to be an internal clock that we build. Mm-hmm. Meaning there has to be some kind of, uh, of, of re- self-reference inside, knowing what my real rhythm is. Mm-hmm. And my real rhythm, again, is not how fast I can run. It's, it's not how, how, how fast I can run a mile. That's not the question. The question is, can I build my day or build my life around certain things that for me define the rhythm? For instance, for instance, if somebody builds their day around prayers, that's how they build it, or around learning at certain times. So the, 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 the good-bad right, is not defined anymore by was it a good day or was it a bad day. The good-bad... Is, is something external to the fact that I have an inner clock that tells me when it's good and bad. What do I mean by when it's good and bad? 
that it's 8 o'clock now, let's say that's how I work, or even if you don't work by hours, I finished eating in the evening, now is the time that I sit and learn. That's it. So good and bad is, did I, did I live up to what I've defined? Right, right, right. Exactly. Not just that, I wanted to say, I wanted to say that the, when the Rebbe wrote the, the Yom Yom, that's exactly yeah. what he had in mind. The, there's a book called Hayom Yom, yeah. which is like a calendar that the, that the, yeah. that the Lubavitcher Rebbe wrote. Yeah. And for every day, he wrote some saying, something. What is he trying to do? He's trying to build you a calendar that's not based, it's not even a Jewish calendar. It, it relates to the Jewish days, but not every day is important, in, right? Today, Tet Tammuz. What, what happened on Tet Tammuz? Nobody knows. So, but if you read the Yom Yom, it's like almost like a, 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 a touch of how his internal time works. Today is the day that I'm connected to this and this thing. This is, this is what I'm working on now. And it's like he's revealing a little bit of his internal clock. So you came to the next level already. Oh, yeah, well, she's not observant, and I'm observant. Okay, okay. so but you said the important word. That when you build your internal clock, you reach redemption. That's really what it's about. Oh. Yeah. Geula, in a, in, a, in a very large sense, and also freedom from... from the things that bother me mentally and psychologically is when I can build an internal clock. It's something your brother wrote on Facebook yesterday. He said... Yeah, <laughs> it's only one right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you write a little bit. You're, you're not your brother. Um, so... We'll discuss that later. So he wrote that somebody triggered him. He's got this word, trigger, which I assume means that he's learned that there are things that, that, you know, they set you off. And he made a pact with himself that he'll never answer when he feels that he's been triggered. And he'll wait for later. Which is a very important thing to do. Okay. It's a great idea. So every person knows, every person knows where, uh, you know, you can, sit, you, can, you can push his buttons. And when the button's pushed, you have to wait until the button goes back to where it was. You can't, don't answer. So, so that's a little bit of an internal clock. That's like saying, this is a bad time to answer. How do I know it's a bad time? It's not because it's 10.15. It's not because it's 12.30 in the afternoon. It's because internally something's been triggered. A trigger is like a time. It's like something... So that's redemption. That if you can build your own internal time scale and not, and not and, and so things interrupt your clock <laughs> <laughs> so says the Alter Rebbe the, the ultimately redeeming form of building an internal clock is mitzvot so I, I don't want to get into how we set a time for learning though I mean don't be crazy <laughs> that's what he said it's not because the clock shows 8.30 and now exactly my wife says but now I need this and that but rather because now I'm learning that and if I can do it pretty much the same time every day, it's even better. But the point is that the rhythm is defined by me, not by something external. Okay, but then something that's, happens that's more important than your learning uh-huh, at that hour. Uh-huh. So if the Torah says you can go and do something else, you can go and do something else. 
that the rhythm is defined by something higher than time. But it's a rhythm, it's a time scale. You don't leave it as just, well, whatever comes, comes. No, it's not whatever comes, comes. I have to learn a certain amount every day. It's a very interesting thing, by the way, that um, there's a whole question. The, a lot of people understand that, and the Rebbe said this many times, that from time to time you have to add more. Add more to what you're doing. So, for instance, when it comes to learning, what does that mean? Is the meaning of that that you add 10 more minutes? Or there's another option, which is that in the time that I have, I do more. I make an effort to do more, not less than what I've done. Meaning, you could say it as being more careful with the time that I've allotted to learning, not to waste it because I got up to get a coffee, to whatever, whatever it is, to keep the time. And you could say that from time to time, you have to feel that the quality of your learning is getting better so that you can cover more ground or in more depth than what you did previously with the same amount of time. And for a long time I had a dilemma which one it was. What does he mean? So I can't, and then I had to come to the conclusion that it has to mean that he doesn't mean more, adding more time. Because if, it's that, if that's what it is, eventually it will be out of time. Because you're basing your clock on something external. What he really means is that you maximize the time that you have by changing the internal clock. And the internal clock, that's the Ratzov HaShov of learning, that's the run and return, the, by the way, Torah equals Ratzov HaShov. It's one of the main things that gives a person a feeling mm-hmm. of, yeah, in Gematria, 611 is equal to Ratzov HaShov, the statement about run and return. And so, it's equal to Torah. So, it's an incredibly strong uh, uh, vehicle for building this internal timekeeping device, right? this internal oscillator inside, the shana inside my, between my nefesh and my uh, olam. So let's go back to the, because I, I do want to end uh, sort of on time today. Um, what's with the Al-Khan Yom Ruah Moshlim Bo Cheshbon, Tibane V'Tikonen Ir Sichon? So we said that the, the, the pshat meaning is the, the ones who make parables. But in the Gemara, and the, the Tzemach Tzedek brings this, he says, Al ken yomu ha-moshlim, ha-moshlim, there's another person that says, ha-moshlim berucham, or it means, ezu gibor ha-kovesh et-itzro. Ha-kovesh et-itzro, that's a moshel. Somebody who is in power, like a memushala, like, some, like a government. So somebody who's governing himself, he's a moshel. And he says, Bo Cheshbon. It's not that let's calculate the time outside. Rather, no, I want to make Cheshbon. I wanna, that's Cheshbon Nefesh every day at the end of the day. Is to, re- confi- is like to reset my watch, my internal watch. And my internal watch is, is not dictated by the external factors. It's dictated by what am I doing? What, what mitzvot am I doing? How am I doing them? That's my internal watch. That's, again, there's this feeling that you can't be misudal, you can't be orderly if you don't have a watch, a wristwatch. The feeling here is that you can't be orderly in anything if you don't have an internal timekeeping device, if you don't have an internal atzobashov. Because the clock is not going to make you orderly. The clock cannot make you do things on time. It can only give you, at most, an indication. And if you don't follow it fully, it becomes frustrating. That's all it does. It, in the end, it depends on the internal timekeeping that you hold, which is, there are certain things that I have to do. And these are the mitzvot that I do every day. This is how I, this is how I function. But I build it internally. So in, in terms of therapy, this is the importance of freeing a person from this feeling that, Things are, weren't done on time. If I only had done them at a different time, only and, and instead to empower the person to begin to build their own internal structure inside, that that's how they should keep time. And then ir sichon, and then you can build a city. A real city is built. It has a pulse. Every city has a pulse. So the real city is built on, on this internal timekeeping device. 
And again, it's, it's structured, says the Alter Rebbe, mostly on mitzvot. And th- that's what liberates you. It redeems you from being a slave to time or being a slave to, again, these external run and returns, these external pulses of reality. The amazing thing is that you can overclock as much as you want. Overclock. Meaning that the regular time frame has a limit to how much, how fast you can go. At most, you know, people are aware of a minute, maybe of 30 seconds. But the more that you build your internal timekeeping, the more you can be sensitive down to minute fractions of a second. There are people who are like that. When they say about them that every second for them is important, it's because every second they're reviewing something. They're doing something. They're not, they're not just sitting letting the time pass. They're doing something with their time. But it's, again, it's not the time in terms of like how many seconds passed on the clock. That's not what they're looking at. It's like that I'm doing something now. I don't just sit there. There's nothing like that. There's always an internal run and return. There's always some action going on. It's not just empty thoughts. So he's always using his time for something. But that only comes if you have an internal, an internal uh, clock. So building that internal clock is one of the strong, most strongly, and we'll return to it because it's a very interesting topic. We haven't really covered everything the author ever says about it. He says a few other things that are very interesting. But the, the basic point here is that it's a very redeeming uh, uh, tool to use when working with somebody. It's like to, to empower them to build their own timekeeping device. Okay, so, so that we learned from Job today, from the beginning. The first thing that he does, that he uh, curses his day, right? That he, f- he, feels, he feels a victim of time. So really the answer is don't be a victim of time. Start building. You have to build your own internal time. It's very, I, I, I'm always amazed when I see it. And like today it's easier to see it. But when I lived in America, it was very clear like that every day is the same. It's unbelievable. This thing, and every hour is the same. The only thing that changes is the sun. In America? When I was around Goyim, I felt it very strongly. Here, I don't feel it so much. And why is it this passion here? It could be. It could be. But, but more people like me. I mean, I go to show a lot. Other people go to show. There's no... I mean, you sort of feel it when... If you, I mean, maybe in New York it's different, but... Um, but you're very comfortable by the same. By being the same, right? So we all have some. Uh, can oh no, not necessarily with the other, but there's a security like yesterday. I did it. Ah, ah, in that sense, it makes everything banal. It makes I, everything I the same. Well, but it, it, it can you know, there are a lot of people that. Um, you just there's a lot of people that we look up to, and they're all very extremely time oriented, and it's very hard for them to change their schedule. Mm-hmm. And so we're not talking about their internal clock, obviously, but. People who are learning and on a higher level, really just um, spiritually, how, how do they fall into a peaceful internal clock that they're not thrown off when their schedules are thrown off? <laughs> that's exactly that. That is exactly the sign. That's exactly the sign that I would let it not be a prison. They, they, they have it's to much more than that. Clock, right. yeah. but forget no, it. no, they don't have an internal clock. That's what she's saying. Maybe they haven't built one. Maybe they just haven't built one, so they're really only going what, to... What's the... Clock. There's a famous story in the Gemara about somebody had an internal clock. Hillel. So somebody comes and starts bothering him a few... Uh, half an hour before Shabbos. Mm-hmm. He's all got all these questions. What do you know that it's, it's Shabbos in half an hour? Now, now is the time to ask me all these ridiculous that's questions? Good. That's an internal... That's a sign of somebody who's built an internal clock. That he, he's, so I, know, I know the sun, so, okay. <laughs> to, to structure my day around something like Yiddishkeit is very good. But again, the question is whether it's internal or whether it's just become another external clock. If it's just another external clock, so of course you'll fight it. Like you'll fight any clock. And you'll hate it. In the end, you'll hate it. Why? Because it impinges on you, it takes away your freedom. The whole point here is the Ratzavashov is part of you. So if a person becomes one with that clock, meaning he's in, completely uh, enclosed in, inside of him, 
So he doesn't, in the same way that the clock doesn't feel pressure. And we've heard that all to change our internal clock is to keep a different pulse moving through. You have to. How do we change our internal clock? No, you try to build it. And, and, and again, the whole idea is that you're building it around Yiddishkeit, around Mitzvot. But I'm building it in such a way that it becomes part of me. The, the, the external clock is never part of me. That's why there's such a dissonance. That's why in the end I can curse it. That's why Eov curses it, because in the end he feels a victim. If I feel a victim of Shabbos, like some people, you don't have to be a, a tzaddik for that. There's a lot of people in America that come Friday in the winter. They're, the Mount Shabbos is a victimizer. <laughs> Right? Everything is like has to grind to a halt. And uh, here in Eretz Yisrael, you know, it just sort of comes in. And even then, you still feel the little, the little pressure. But it's not the same thing because people don't work. But it can become, yeah, some people don't work. Some people don't work on Friday. But um, if you do work, then Shabbos becomes like Mamisha, like it's victimizing. You. What do you want from me? But if it becomes you. So who cares? I, 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 this is not when I work, period. It just won't work. That's the difference, right? That I, I've internalized it. External clocks cannot be internalized. That's the whole point. That's the whole difference between them and Torah and mitzvahs. But they kind of are, but it's light too. Why? We have lighting today. You can change. My, right. I don't know. My kids have no problem changing night into day and day into night. They have absolutely no problem. Night in our I'm very nocturnal. If I could stay up until the four every morning and, and then right. sleep, I uh, choose that I can't sleep any sleep in anymore. But but let's say that I that I, like when I was younger, I could definitely do that. I think that's why my kids do it. It's not, very very accomplishing it's not accomplishing, right? Because I'm a victim of time. That's why exactly what I'm saying. Don't but. Right, okay. And, and then are you tired or not? She's too busy to sleep in her sleep. No, are, the, are, the, are they tired no, or not? No, they're not tired. They're they, they go to sleep at 12 the midnight day, yeah. and then 6.45 they're up yeah. and they don't fall asleep at 7 the next day. No. They're like, that's just their they're clock. Going. Okay, well, fine. fine. And now if they, tr if they do need to sleep, so they become a victim, they can't sleep. If you have an internal clock, if, right, if you have an internal clock, you're not a victim of, 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 uh, of even your biorhythm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One part of it. Yeah. Because something happened to them. They, every every Shagami, it was, it was an event. It was important for them, and that's could why. Be, could be, that they, they took, took their cue. Like that. It was an event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but she's that's saying, why, was, why didn't they all know all three? Why weren't they aware? So, so it says that, that no, Yitzchak knew. Can, okay, but they didn't do. I say that, yeah. but they focused. They focused on one. Yeah. Okay, and definitely that that's their time. That's their time right. of day. There's something, but, but exactly when is that? No, <laughs> there's no exact time, right? Like even chakras, it's not like at ten by ten o five you have to finish. No. Eh, it changes, it fluctuates. Right. Uh, it's, on, uh, it's longer, it's shorter. And in, and in any case, it's pretty wide. So. But, but again, the stress here is that when you internalize this timekeeping device, whatever it is, it, first of all, it can be much faster than the timekeeping devices on the outside. And secondly, it doesn't, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, hold you by the neck. So that's how you put each other Maybe. Could be. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, could be. So someone with an internal clock should be very flexible. Right, they're very flexible, and like Hill, they're very calm. And there's always time. Um, there was something like this, and I don't want to mention it. This was taken in different... Um, there's a saying, I, I will say, because I'll explain the difference. Uh, in the opening scene of... Uh, of uh, I think it's the Hobbit. Mm -hmm. So there's a wizard there who shows up. I can't remember the names anyway. So he shows up, and the Hobbit tells him, "You're late," and he says to him, 
A wizard is never late and he's never early. He's always exactly on time. Mm-hmm. But what does he mean? He means to say that I know, like Bilam, the workings of the natural cycles. He doesn't mean at all that it's coming from inside of him, that this is the time. But exactly what, 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 what does the Jew feel when he builds this internal clock? Then now is the time. It's the best time in the world. This is the best time to teach this. There can't be a better time. It's never going to repeat either. That's what you begin to feel. You begin to feel that this is the exact moment to do this mitzvah. Why? Because Not because in the, in the Shemaim they said so. Because every moment becomes a reflection of something internal that's, that's driving it. So you don't see Hashem's pulse. Okay, okay. And, and that's different. Different personalities. Different, that's different pulses. Like, yeah. Everything has a different pulse. Right. right. And, and, and what I start with is that you can't time anything. Mm-hmm. Timing is everything and it, you can't time it. The only way you can time it is if it becomes something internal to you. And then you're always on time. You're exactly on time. That's the feeling. The feeling is that I this was the time. No, when you're world talking world. about your mental well-being, how it matches up with the rest of the world is less, less critical. It's first of all how you see it. That you see that these things are all good. But to be able to see that they're all good, you have to have your, this internal timekeeping. So again, time here is, so is a bad mean, word because... But, so instead of... Instead of using time, you should use pulse all the time. That's the real word. Dofik. That's the word that the Alter Rebbe uses. Dofik, dofik, dofik. He repeats it a few times. Okay? What are the first steps in building an internal clock? I mean, everyone has an internal clock, so how are you building it up? Okay, so... So again, the, the question here here is whether the... Um, this internal pulse, is it like, again, we, we like, uh, uh, said like, like doctors, they'll take your pulse and they'll say it's 70. But it's not. Mm-hmm. It's constantly, the run and return, the pulse is constantly changing. So that's the first thing to accept, that internal pulse is different, the real pulse is different from the pulse that you see on a clock. It's different than the pulse that you see on a computer. Those are constant. And the whole reason they work is because they're constant. But a human pulse, a living pulse, is different. It's fluctuating all the time. So steady here is, again, is not that at this time every day I do something. But rather when I'm doing it, the pulse is there. Right? The, the pulse is maybe guiding me, but less, less than what it's guiding me, it's, it's working with me. And that if now is the time to dive in, okay, that, that all the pulse is there for that. The whole run and return is for that. Don't use the word time. I keep using it, but it's, yeah, it's the wrong word. He, do, he, do, he doesn't even, almost, he do, not even, that's why he says it's called Shanai. Does it, why Shanai? Because Shanai is from changes. And you don't have to have a push of time. No, it's not related to time in that sense. I love this time. I like to go there. What? Where I live with Zai, it really helps me to yeah, do It's very interesting that Zai in Yiddish is, 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 is time. Oh, really? Zai. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not the same. It's just not the same way. It's 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 not the same the, the the sound of my beloved is is, is pulsing. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's tapping into okay, yeah, your internal yeah. pulse. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We said this. And there is such a thing. And the way to get to it, we said this through the mitzvot, but but even more than that, just nimut Torah. 
that Limut Torah, yeah. it, it, it aligns it with that inner. It must also be that some people have it more. I mean, you know. No, so the, again, the the the, the that the author of it gave is that it's a it's an intermediate between the life force and the vessel. But if become the, aware of it. Like it's, it's almost like saying that there are times for if you haven't developed it fully, that you're not in control of it of this pulse. It's controlling you, maybe at some level still. So there are times when you can't go as fast, and times you can go faster. But really, the ultimate the ultimate meaning that he's trying to get to is that you 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 define it. So you have the power to define how fast this pulse is going to go. It always quickens and, and, and lowers, but the question is the basic unit. How fast is it moving? When a person's quick, when, when he's built his, his neshama strongly, he's, he's built this pulse, he's like, you've got a strong pulse. So it's very, very fast. And, okay. It's how many cycles do you need to finish a, an operation? So if your cycles go very slowly and you need 10 cycles, so it'll take a minute. If they go very quickly, like we said, that you add from time to time. What does it mean that you add from time to time? That your pulse quickens. That your internal pulse. Okay, so that's, uh, that's enough for today, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll do one more share on this next week.